Welcome back, AP. All right, so let's make sure we're recording and we're good to go. Very impressed with how some of y'all did on that quiz today. All right, so as you remember, today is a big day for us because I was completely fine with making a flip a tiny bit longer so we could continue to review, continue to go over stuff, continue to progress forward, and also to give you some more practice with that multiple choice stuff before your next test comes up, right? But again, very impressed with how y'all did. Some of y'all were really, really crushing it, but again, on this first quiz, I'm only counting each question as three points, so you could technically get every single one wrong and still get a 70, right? So the chances of that are doubtful, but this is just because it's your first go around. On the next quiz, they're going to be probably worth more like five points apiece, and then we'll keep building our way up as we go on. Now, anyway, so we left off talking about the Reformation and how the Reformation really truly began, uh, like actually earlier on in what you could consider the early Renaissance slash the Middle Ages, right? With Marsiglio of Padua suggesting the conciliar movement, with Lorenzo Valla, right? Very important that you go back in your notes and you highlight this list of stuff, right? Highlight this big list of stuff, the eggs that were laid of the um, movement against the church during the Middle Ages, right? Talking about like how Erasmus' praise of folly and Sir Thomas More's utopia and the conciliar movement and the great Western schism, like multiple popes, the don donation constantly being a forgery, warrior popes like Julius II. Now, anyway, so those things are kind of important to know. But also, to take it a step further, the church themselves was even were even violating rules that one of their own came up with, right? So to give you an understanding of what I mean by that, there is this former saint, right? Saint Benedict, or excuse me, Saint Benedict, yeah, Saint Benedict, right? The very first Saint Benedict who established this idea of Benedictine rule, right? Now, in the 6th century BC, so soon after the fall of Rome, St. Benedict establishes a set of rules that church officials are meant to lead their lives by, right? Now, particularly supposed to be rules that pertain mainly, mainly to the ideas of how monks live inside of a monastery, right? Now, as we know, most, if you were to eventually become a pope or a cardinal, that these rules were heavily ingrained into your mind, right? And so that St. Benedict created these rules to try to formalize the education and the practices of monks, right? And some of the rules were really, really crazy. Like, uh, like some of them, actually, let me rephrase. Some of them made a lot of sense, right? Especially for the time period. Some of the ones that made sense were like, oh, you will take vows of silence and labor, right? Where you will actually sit in silence and actually copy one Latin text of the Bible to another Latin text of the Bible to create more Bibles for the church themselves to use, right? You will be <clears throat> expected to preach a certain number of times a day. You will be expected to serve mass a certain number of times in a month. You will be expected to offer shelter to wayward travelers of Europe. You will be expected to do this, to do that. It's all really, really intense rules that are supposed to talk about how monks were supposed to live their lives while they were being trained to become members of the Catholic Church. And they were created several hundred years before Luther ever even existed. And some of the rules to me are really, really funny. Like apparently how they're not allowed to eat cloven hooved animals, or they had they had, to, they had to have a light on in their room at all times and had to be fully dressed at all times when they were like even in bed so they could jump up at any moment and actually go and preach, right? So, and they also believe that like anything, anyone sleeping in darkness and stuff like that is not doing anything that is supposed to be appropriate, blah, 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 blah. But like, it's all these other crazy rules, right? But during the 12th and 13th century, so during the 1100s and the 1200s of Europe, three key rules are going to be added. Chastity, poverty, and obedience, right? To the Benedictine rule in the, 11th, in the 1100s and the 1200s, i.e. the 12th and the 13th century, the rules of chastity, po chastity, chastity, poverty, and obedience are going to be like actually included inside of the Benedictine rule. Basically saying that churches must live a chaste life, right? Free from indulgences, free from marriage, and free from being tempted by any outside ideas, especially the ideas of another gender or becoming married, right? Now, the other big one was poverty, right? Now, why was chastity such a big deal, first of all, going into before we get into poverty? Chastity was a big deal, again, because it was supposed to not distract monks from their study, right? So, poverty. Why is poverty a big rule? Because they basically were taking a vow that your study and your ideas of becoming a priest, a monk, or a cardinal even later on, or even, know, who knows, possibly the Pope, should not be things that you do for wealth, 
They should be things that you do for free. Be things because spreading the word of God is not supposed to actually bring you financial gain, right? And then obedience to the church leader, as in listening to the Pope because he has gone through these things like you have and he has established that the Benedictine rule is important and he lives his life by them. But wait a second. Benedict, hold up. Back up, Terry. Did the church violate those rules going into the Reformation slash Renaissance period? Uh, yeah. The church during the 1300s and the 1400s heavily violated rules that they themselves made up, right? They had Pope Alexander VI, who had an illegitimate child named Rodrigue Borgia, who, had, or no, Rodrigue Borgia is the name of Alexander VI, and his son, Cesar Borgia, is going to be the illegitimate leader, or like an illegitimate son of the Pope and a leader of an Italian province. So he wasn't being chased, right? And then also the poverty aspect, popes were living fabulous lives and paying Michelangelo so many ducats just to paint the ceiling of a Sistine Chapel that didn't necessarily need to be repainted. You could have kept it the starry field, Julius. It wouldn't have been a big deal. But again, that's not being poverty. You're hiring Renaissance artists to make everything gorgeous every five friggin' seconds just so you can have something nice to look at. Boom! That rule being violated as well. In obedience. That rule was being violated in a different way. Maybe, maybe, yes, it was still being followed as in the cardinals were listening to the Pope and other people were listening to the Pope. But correct me if I'm wrong, but how are you supposed to remain obedient when there are multiple Popes during the Middle Ages? How are you supposed to remain obedient when the Pope himself is violating the chastity and chastity, the chastity and poverty rules, right? So these rules, these Benedictine rules that were made up by the church on how to govern the lives of their clerics and also their priests were being violated by the highest offices of the Catholic Church in the first place, right? So how is it possible that we didn't actually think that this was going to happen, right? So really quick, though, you're going to see because of the violations of these Benedictine rules, because of the violations of the church during the Middle Ages, because of the conciliar movement, because of the Hussites being snuffed out, because of uh, the Sir Thomas More as utopia and the praise of folly making its way all around Europe, you're going to see the growth of this idea called anti-clericalism, right? And anti-clericalism was this idea of opposition to church clergy, as in the sense that they did not think that they were actually good people, that they believed right here that the church clergy was actually she wolves in sheep's clothing. But in this particular rendition, it's a wolf in priest clothing, right? So there was a growing idea that your church uh, leaders were actually doing things wrong, right? And were they right? Yeah, they, they were right, right? So they were really, really right because they were going to see rebellions against this one big thing they were doing wrong known as pluralism, right? Again, violating this poverty perspective. Pluralism is what the priests were doing, right? So you can write that down as a little thing right there. Pluralism was a violation against the people that priests were doing. And you're seeing small little town rebellions against it. Pluralism is the idea that a priest would hold multiple offices in a church at, like, at a time to gain the salaries of every single office. So not only are you the priest in this parish, but you're also the priest in that parish, but then you're also the deacon for this parish, but then you're also the organizer or a monk for this monastery. You're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing that, you're doing that, and you're also being appointed to these things by friends that you have within the church, and so you're making a lot of money instead of actually focusing on your craft, right? So pluralism is one of the things that led to anti-clericalism. And a there were other really mundane reasons as well. So anti-clericalism is this opposition to clergy, right? And a big reason why anti-clericalism popped up were the violations of the Middle Ages, the violations of the Benedictine rule, and then also the establishment of pluralism that was a big widespread issue amongst churches throughout Europe. But there were also some like funny and like mundane kind of stuff like so like for example uh like town folk right like basic com like commoners throughout europe accused their priests of being mumblers that didn't actually know latin right they were like oh well our priest just stands up there and does this inominate patre et smelly et martinu moss bay right and so like they didn't even apparently know latin 
And apparently that they would just sit there and mumble in incoherent sentences and be like, oh, 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 it's Latin, it's Latin, I know what I'm talking about, right? So, like, townsfolk were accusing their priests of doing these things, right? They were accusing their priests of being fancy dressers, which violates that Benedictine rule of poverty. They were accusing them of being fornicators and actually violating their rules of chastity. They were accusing nuns of being lustful, which I think is hilarious and so funny to me, and I don't know why. I know I work at a Catholic church or, or a Catholic school, and I'm not supposed to find that funny, but it's pretty funny. And they also, the big one was they were accusing them of being greedy, right? Like, so big things to understand, big, big, big things to understand here. And another big reason why townsfolk didn't like their clerics and or their priests very much, and why this is sowing the seeds of the ability for the Reformation to take hold and run forward, the reason why, because remember, Luther, if people, if common people, if regular people in Europe were not already mad at the church, Luther's reforms would have gone nowhere. He would have been like, I... 95 reasons why I'm mad, and then everybody would have been like, oh, shut up, dude, I love my church, right? Yes, they were pious, and yes, they loved their faith, but they did not like how things were going in the church setting. And another big reason why regular townsfolk really did not like the clerics and the people working in the church is because priests were free from two things. One, they were not forced to fight. No priest... And no commoner, or excuse me, no priest as opposed to every commoner in any war would ever be expected to serve in the military. So a lot of common folk of Europe were very upset about this. A lot of common folk were also upset about the fact that priests were never taxed, right? Underline that, circle it, highlight it, make it look like it's exploding because it does come up throughout history that a lot of people were very angry against the Catholic Church because they believed that like the priests didn't actually pay taxes or contribute back to these growing nation states, right? So especially when it pops up in the French Revolution, we'll get to that stuff later on. And then also the Catholic Church owned almost 30% of all the land in many countries because of the church lands that it sat on and the, the requisite cemeteries that went along with them, right? So this is a huge problem because as people are now, as these serfs are now leaving and you look over and you're like, well, the nobles own a third of all the land and the church owns a third of all the land. So what's left for the rest of Europe? 30%. For the commoners, which is the greatly outnumbering class of people, like this is a big problem. We're getting into a state where literally people are looking at their church and the people who run it, and it's really, really causing some anger, right? And these conflicts and anger, this is going to be the big reason why so many monarchs demand that they're allowed to appoint their own church officials, why they want to appoint, appoint their own bishops, right? That's a big thing. Remember the investiture crisis out of the Middle Ages. Monarchs wanted to choose bishops and cardinals on their own because they actually believed that some of these other bishop, bishops and cardinals were greedy, were lustful, were, uh, were mumblers, were not educated, were violating the rules of the faith, right? Now also, as we know, Monarchs also wanted to do this so they could grow their power, but it's a reason that they use to say, oh, we should be able to appoint our own church officials because of all these negative reasons why, right? Now, monarchs also wanted church officials to take on civic responsibilities, right? Monarchs were like, okay, we want to appoint our own bishops because we want our bishops to be expected to serve not in combat, but as a part of our military. We want to be able to choose our bishops so we can eventually start taxing church lands. We want to be able to appoint our bishops so we can have people on our side when we try to push these reform movements through property assets of the church, right? So this is a big reason. So now you're also seeing the church and the monarchy start to butt heads, right? Because you now have two powers that are growing, right? Because the nobles are kind of falling off. The nobles were the dominant power in the Middle Ages. No question, because they had access to the serfs and the vassals and the people of which lived upon their land. And they could even rise up in revolt against a king in like two seconds. The Magna Carta in 1215 in the Middle Ages Literally, the king of England was forced to sign a document at the tip of a sword, right, by nobles themselves. It's not like that anymore, right? Coming out of the Middle Ages and going into the Reformation, monarch's power is growing, but the church power is still steady and very strong as well. Church officials want to be appointed, or excuse me, the monarchs want to appoint their own church officials so they can continue to grow their power and keep the Catholic Church where they are. And the best thing that could have possibly happened was... The Reformation for these rulers, right? Now, anyway, 
just so you understand too, so you can understand the bedrock, the formation, the where we are, the wherewithal, the everything else, you got to understand pre-Reformation politics a little bit too. Speaking of these monarchs and whatnot. So what country do you think that the Reformation is going to affect the most dramatically, right? I'll hit you with three. You ready? I'll hit you with three. Actually, I'll hit you with four. All right, so you ready? Well, three, it's okay. Make a bullet point list, okay? The countries that are going to be most affected by the Reformation up front, right? You ready? One, the Holy Roman Empire, right? The Holy Roman Empire, which is where Luther is from, right? The Holy Roman Empire includes modern-day Germany. It includes modern-day Switzerland. It includes modern-day Netherlands. It includes modern-day Bohemia, a.k.a. the Czech Republic. It includes modern-day Austria. It includes modern-day Liechtenstein. It even includes modern-day Northern Italy, right? So the Holy Roman Empire was absolutely massive. And the, Revol or the Reformation takes hold on there the most severely, and it gets very, very intense, right? Now... Yard. Anyway, so where else is it going to affect? Second one, second biggest power it's going to affect, England. And we'll get to the Tudors and their Reformation later on. The th third biggest one is kind of like this weird split. It's France slash Switzerland, right? And the only reason some nerd right now that's probably not even in my AP class probably watches is like, well, is it France and Switzerland? Because France is going to have their wars of religion too. Yeah, that's true, but we're going to come up to that later. And also, I like to say France slash Switzerland due to the fact that Calvin himself was actually French up front and then eventually did move to Switzerland. But we'll talk about that later on, all right? So, but the big thing is pre-Reformation politics, you got to understand before we even get there, the countries that this is going to affect the most, right? Because even following the Reformation, Italy will remain devoutly Catholic, Spain will remain devoutly Catholic, Portugal will remain devoutly Catholic, right? All these other places will remain very, very Catholic, right? Now, who is going to be the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire when Luther pops up? Oh, here he is. His name is Charles V, right? Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor himself, right? The guy that gets the worst rap for being actually not that bad of a ruler, all right? So, like, he's actually a pretty solid ruler when you actually look back on him in the history scape, right? We don't like his ascension to power because he bribed people to get in there, which we'll explain in a second. Uh, we don't really like necessarily like his management, but also the dude just owned too much, right? Like, so, like, Charles V was doomed to failure from the get-go, right? So, like, uh, let's look at the map of rule Charles the Fifth, right? Let's see how much stuff Charles the Fifth actually owned, right? So, by technicality, this is how much of the world Charles the Fifth was in control of, right? Because he controlled the Holy Roman Empire, right? He also controlled Spain. But wait a second. He also controlled Portugal because he married a princess from Portugal, right? But wait a second. He also controlled all of the territories that were controlled by Spain. How the heck does this one dude have the possibility of owning all of this stuff? A lot of it has to do with his ascension to power, right? A lot of it has to do with his ascension to power. Well, first of all, let's take a little gander at him. What family do we think he's from? Looking at this goofy jaw, what family do we think he's from? Good job, Carson. I heard you. I also heard Ange Angelina, and I also heard uh, Lauren Gross freaking out about it over there. He's a Habsburg, right? He's a Habsburg because you can see, like, the nice big fat jaw on the bottom, right? He's actually a Habsburg prince, right? And he is the grandson of Isabella and Ferdinand. <gasps> Wait a minute. That's why he controls all of Spain's stuff. Because he is the grandson of Isabella and Ferdinand of Castile. He is the grandson and the rightful heir to the Spanish throne. He also is going to be the nephew of Henry VIII's first wife. So Charles V is our first highly interconnected result of marriage between royal families, right? Because Isabella and Ferdinand had a child, right? They had a daughter, and their daughter was named Joanna the Mad, right? So they had a couple of sons, but they all died. And then, like, so they had one surviving daughter, and Joanna the Mad would actually marry Maximilian I of the Holy Roman Empire, son, Philip the Handsome. Philip the Handsome and Joanna the Mad give birth to Charles V, right? So Charles V, by proxy, when he comes to control the Holy Roman Empire, 
He also was already in control of Spain. He then marries a princess from Portugal, so he controls Portugal. So he then, can, he actually, following exploration, controlled everything Spain owned in the New World, everything Portugal owned in all of their conquests for spices, and then also everything that the Holy Roman Empire was associated with, right? So he owned almost 25% of the world, and or control it, right? Now, really quick though, but here's the thing. The Holy Roman Empire isn't based off of uh, heraldry, right? It's not based off of hereditary. So we know he took over Spain because of who he was, because of who his parents were, right? How did he become the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire though? It has to do with this, the seven electors, right? So in the 1200s, I believe it's either 1210 or 1219, this document was passed called the Golden Bull, right? And the Golden Bull decided by the Pope that there would be seven electors, seven people who would appoint and vote on whoever is going to be the next Holy Roman Emperor, right? So he was chosen by those electors and voted, and he won the vote four to three at the age of 19. Who the heck is going to elect a 19-year-old? How did he convince those four people? Uh, bribes, right? The Habsburg family bribed four of the electors to vote him in to be the Holy Roman Emperor, right? So because of this, though, Charles V was just out the gate, kind of like screwed. Like there was no way. There is no way he's going to be able to control all of this stuff, right? Not anyway. He actually ends up, spoiler alert, he actually ends up going crazy, right? So like Charles V actually ends up going completely insane. And then he ends up giving away his empire to his brother and his son. And he splits the Habsburg family in half. See how it's the double-headed eagle? He splits it in half and creates an Austrian branch and a Spanish branch. He eventually ends up retiring to a monastery where he dies of alcoholism gout, right? So like, but we'll talk about that stuff later on. There's a bunch of really good stories with Charles V and how he actually ends up going crazy. He fixes his own funeral. All right, anyway, now. Now, but yeah, so he just owned too much, right? So when you're looking at the politics, though, of in the biggest thorn in his side, he was losing labor in Latin America due to the diseases, right? He was doing fine in Spain, but he could manage everything that was going on. He could look over the ocean and be like, okay, I can figure out how to control our new colonies. But from within, in the Holy Roman Empire, this dude just jacked his rule up the like just so bad all right so enter luther right martin luther martin luther himself decides that he is going to be the match that lights the fuse right luther is the match the complaints against the church are the fuse he shows up and becomes the reformer of all reformers right so just to give you like a little bit of luther background right? A little bit of Luther background. So just so you know, he is originally German. Uh, Luther would have spoken German as a child. It would have been the language that he learns. He eventually did become fluent in Latin due to the fact that he does become a priest, right? Now, he actually didn't set out to become a priest. Martin Luther originally wanted to be a lawyer, right? So he actually went to school to be a lawyer, went to university to be a, be a lawyer, following the movements of the early Renaissance because the universities in Europe begin to pop up more and more, these converted monasteries, right? And they begin to offer things like medical, science studies, law, rhetoric, language, and he actually goes to school for law, right? But one day, when he's running back from one building to another, a storm pops up, right? In the town that he is from, which I believe he is from modern-day Nuremberg, right? So, Nuremberg, Germany. Now, the big thing is, actually, let's look that up. I don't think he's from Vems. Um, where is Luther from? Uh, Luther, where is Martin Luther from? Uh, ah, Eiselben, Germany, which I think is near Nuremberg. Um, anyway, so the big thing about it is he eventually goes off and like he's running from one like building to the other. And while he's running, a storm pops up. And it turns out Martin Luther is terrified of storms. So he collapses down on his knees while lightning and thunder is flashing all around him. And he looks up to the skies and he goes, St. Anne, St. Anne, if you save me from this storm, I will forever devote myself to your church, right? So... And he just doesn't die, so he becomes a priest, right? He becomes a priest, but he actually becomes a different kind of priest, right? He becomes a university priest, where he then actually becomes a professor, right? He becomes a professor, and he begins his long journey of study and actually analyzing the growth of the Catholic Church, but also he starts seeing the negatives of the Catholic Church. Because while he was a professor, he summarized his beliefs into three key pieces. And this is before he even started the Reformation. But while a professor, he said... You must have faith alone, you must have the scripture alone, 
and you must have grace alone. So before Luther even started the Reformation, unintentionally, he didn't mean to start new churches. He just meant to kind of push reform, and he expected to stay Catholic. But when the Catholics refused to change, he eventually did start a new church. Um, but in this concept, faith alone, scripture alone, and grace alone, you're kind of basically saying that there is no need for a clergy, right? This is him kind of basically saying that, oh, we don't need priests because all you need is your faith because God knows your soul. All you need is the Bible because you should be able to read it. So that means he's advocating for vernacular Bibles. This is a big deal. And he said that the only thing will save you is not that of a priest blessing a piece of bread. The thing that will save you will be God's grace saving you, right? So that's a big deal. Luther shows up and absolutely rocks the world, right? He shows up and decides to start a reformation. But why? Because of these. What is the final straw on the camel's back? Luther was a professor. He was studying. Former lawyer, law student, actually decides that he's going to get involved with actually trying to create some new Christian doctrine and stuff. And this is before he ever posts the 95 Theses, right? So what is the thing that's going to crush him? What's going to be the thing that is going to be the straw on the camel's back? The thing that he just decides, like, enough is enough. I got I to gotta write down why I'm angry, right? Has to do with these things known as indulgences, right? Which a lot of y'all already seem to know what they are, which is really awesome. Hmm. Oh, really quick fun fact, too. But you can't guess who painted this, Carson. Yep, that's a higher name is Bosch piece, right? I think that's from the um, Last Judgment by Bosch right now. But anyway, indulgences, first of all, before we go anywhere further, they technically exist in the Bible, right? So technically, indulgences or the concept of indulgences and in Christian teachings have existed since the 11th century. So since the 10 hundreds, right? So since then, um, indulgences have actually been something that the Catholic Church has preached, but they're not supposed to be what they turned into, right? So indulgences are supposed to be good deeds. It's supposed to be a thing that you do to prove your worth to God, to show him that you are on the right track as a good Christian person, right? So they are supposed to be things that you prove to him that shows that your soul should be freed from purgatory or have a shortened sentence, right? They can be verbal indulgences. They can be written indulgences. It's this idea that you basically can do a good thing and your soul, through confession, reconciliation, and everything else, will actually receive a lessened time in purgatory, right? Like So big thing, though, is... In the 12th century, though, the 1300s, some, Rome, some rogue church officials and popes, they start selling them. That's what the word hawk means. To hawk it means to, like, sell it. So this is going to cause a ripple effect throughout the entire system of the Catholic faith, mainly due to one issue. Now, originally, when they start selling these indulgences, the upper class is loving it, right? They love the idea that you could go off and you could buy an indulgence and you could donate to the church and that would be your good deed. And then the priest would write you a piece of paper that said like, ah, less time in purgatory and hand it to you, right? The upper class in the Middle Ages, right, the 1300s, they're going to be down with this. But as the Renaissance begins to roll forward and as the consumer revolution and the commercial revolution begin to bring more intelligence and money and economies back to Europe again, by the end of the 1400s, people are going to be like, something smells weird here because I'm not rich enough to afford salvation from God. Because here's the big reason why indulgences were so terribly negative. If you were rich, they were awesome. If you were poor, they were unaccessible to you or you had to basically save your life savings to get a piece of paper that may or may not get you out of purgatory sooner right so this is a very sketchy thing that was going on and to give you a quote from the most famous indulgence writer of them all this dude that johann tetzel who is the guy that finally drives martin luther over the edge and actually sends him into writing these things he said a very famous quote in a pamphlet that he sent all around europe when a penny in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs, right? Basically saying a coffer is a box, right? It's the offering box. And a coffer actually looks like a little coffin, right? It's like a little box with like a little like elevated lid. And you would just go, and you would actually drop a penny in the donation box. And he's basically saying like, oh, 
Every time I hear a penny, that's a soul getting out of purgatory, right? He's selling salvation. You can't do that. That guy, Johann Tetzel, is the dude that sends him over the edge. But here's the funniest part about it. Johann Tetzel, it wasn't even his idea, right? Like, it wasn't even Johann Tetzel's idea to start selling them over the top and actually, like, advertising the selling of indulgence. It's actually this dude, Pope Leo X. Highlight his name, circle his name. He comes up so often throughout history, mainly because he's starting to show the corruption of the church. Guess what family he's from? That's right. You can read. Proud of you, Grace, Chuck Snyder. He's a Medici Pope, right? He is literally a Pope that found fame, education, glory, and leadership of the Catholic Church because of how wealthy his family was. So Leo X is appointed Pope um, during the late 1400s. And he, no, actually, right after Pope uh, Leo X comes right after Julius, right? So he comes immediately after Julius II, after Julius II dies, and Pope Leo X is appointed, right? He decides that, like Julius, he wants to spruce some stuff up at the Vatican, right? Like, so he decides he wants to make it better. He was like, well, Julius used the tithe to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and paid Michelangelo a buttload of money, so I'm going to do something similar, and I'm going to pay Michelangelo to redo the, the dome on St. Peter's Basilica, right, in the Vatican. But the problem was, is that he was a little short on funds. So he decides to tell priests in the Holy Roman Empire, hey, do me a favor, pay our debts off, and start pushing indulgences hard, right? And the guy that made Martin Luther so mad, Johann Tetzel, is a dude that decides to not only sell regular indulgences, but he decides to sell premium grade indulgences the ferrari the lamborghini of indulgences and he decides to start selling indulgences that not only got you out of purgatory but offered them to get your dead family members out of purgatory so johann tetzel was trying to pay off his own debt pay off the church debt and then also pay off debts that would be going into paying for the remodeling of saint peter's by pushing indulgences that were more expensive so that you could get your family members out of debt. And this right here is the advertisement on the pamphlet that he would send around the Holy Roman Empire, literally saying, because it says it right here, literally it says, when a penny in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Because you can actually see the word springt, which in German means to spring or to jump, right? So he literally had a poem printed on a pamphlet, because pamphlets are very important. What you probably could do right now is somewhere in your notes, just off the sides, like pamphlets are very important. They become like the main conveyance of intelligence and information throughout this period of time. And so this is the advertisement that Johann Tetzel decides to start throwing out there to bring people in to sell their sins away, right? And Martin Luther is having none of it, right? And we will talk about Martin Luther and his 95 Theses and what actually happened with the 95 Theses next time I see you in class. Y'all have a good one.